The concept of light is one of those things that if scientifically and spiritually understood would completely change everything we think we know about the universe. And that's the real key here. It must be understood both scientifically and spiritually, not just one way or the other. Now, if we look to human history, we can see references to light in almost every ancient culture in a multitude of ways. From the dawn of religion, light itself had been intimately connected to the creation of reality. Although sun worship is used a lot as a term for pagan religions, direct worship of the big old gas ball is actually relatively rare. Although almost every culture uses solar motifs in their mythology, only a relatively few cultures, mainly Egyptian, Indo-European, and Mesoamerican ones, developed entirely solar religions. The main thing that these cultures shared was a well-developed and urbanized society that centered around sacred kingship. In almost all of them, in one way or another, imagery of the sun as the ruler of both the upper and lower worlds that he majestically visits on his daily journey is pretty prominent. Most of these beliefs revolve around the idea that the sun as the bestower of light and warmth is the guardian of justice and order. They say that our divine father upholds and gives structure to the universe. With an almost universal connection of light with enlightenment or illumination, the sun is also a great source of wisdom for us. Interestingly though, while it's taken for granted that the sun is a masculine entity, this wasn't always the case. Certainly in most romance languages, the sun is gendered as male, like le soleil in French, el sol in Spanish, and il soleil in Italian. But in Germanic languages, the sun is generally given a feminine status as in the German die Sonne. The reason for this distinction isn't all that clear as the Proto-Indo-European root from which a lot of these languages derive had the word Sunno as an inanimate gender. In fact, in Proto-Indo-European mythology, the sun appeared to be multi-layered, manifesting as a goddess, but also perceived as the eye of the sky father, Dias. In more modern new age circles, the sun and by extension light itself is also the life-giving source that provides the nourishing spirit, which brings life to the whole planet. And thus the energy of the sun is the same energy that is at the source of our life essence. It's often described that God, source, Allah, Brahma, or any of these words is either light or perhaps that from this spirit, light is the first thing to emerge. If we were to look to Gnostic philosophy to name but one school of thought, it is said that our true selves are beings of light that can eventually be liberated. Our day-to-day -day choices and the degree to which we awaken to truth from illusion will either prevent or allow us to become a living embodiment of the light that we are inside. Now, when talking about light, this brings up the subject of visible light, electromagnetic radiation, and quote unquote, spiritual light. And we need to make this distinction right off the bat because a question must be asked, what even is light? Believe it or not, that question is actually way harder to answer than you might think. Generally speaking, light is defined as a form of electromagnetic radiation that's within the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see with our physical eyes. In other words, light is electromagnetic radiation that has a wavelength of about 400 to 700 nanometers. So basically anything in between infrared and ultraviolet on the electromagnetic spectrum. In physics though, the word light can also sometimes mean EM radiation of any wavelength, not just the visible ones, in case you thought we had it easy. So before we can talk about light, let's ask a deeper question. What is electromagnetic radiation? Well, to put it simply, it's the waves or rather their quanta, a fancy word for absolute minimum amount of the electromagnetic field moving through space, carrying electromagnetic energy. And in that case, what is the electromagnetic field? That one is simple enough, right? It's just a classical, i.e. non-quantum field. And by the way, field is just multiple points in space-time that are represented by a number produced by moving electrical charges. So at the risk of meeting Alice this far down the rabbit hole, let's ask the last big question. What is electrical charge? The short answer, if you were to ask a physicist would be, it's just a property of matter. But what does that even mean? Well, the electromagnetic forces are one of the fundamental forces of physics. So electrical charge is really one point where everything begins. You could even say that as a fundamental force, charge is one of the defining aspects of physics and therefore our universe. But that doesn't explain what it is. What does it mean for an electron to have a negative charge and a proton to have a positive one? The truth is we don't quite know for sure. No one does. Subatomic particles acquire their charge through balancing out polarities and quantum processes that we're still studying. But all we can really say with any certainty is that if charge exists and works like we describe it does, 
then everything seems to work out and be self-consistent and explain slash predict so much. Even though that doesn't prove charge is real, it makes it way more likely that it is than it isn't. The big problem really comes down to a science versus philosophy kind of deal. Charge is a fundamental part of a universe, one of the building blocks of all things. But sooner or later, we just have to accept the fundamental forces as fundamental and don't question why they're there. We just study and experience them. The exact nature of charge is one of the big mysteries of the universe. And some of the greatest minds are still confused and discussing it today. While we don't know exactly how to define it apart from calling it a property of matter, we do know a lot about how it behaves. We know that protons and electrons are bearers of charge that help bind and hold the universe together. Like gravity, it's one of the fundamental forces of nature. Coming back to light though, when physicists talk about the speed of light, they're actually talking about the speed of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum. When a particle with an electromagnetic charge oscillates or accelerates, it disturbs the electromagnetic field and sends out waves of energy. The wavelength of the radiation can be determined by how much energy is sent out by the charged particle. So in other words, the longer the wavelength, the smaller its frequency, how fast it bobs up and down, and the less dangerous it is to us while the opposite is true for higher frequency radiation with shorter wavelengths. The wavelength of EM waves can be as long as a football field in the case of radio waves or shorter than an atom in the case of gamma waves, which may or may not turn you into a giant green hulking ball of anger. Now to discuss spiritual light, on the other hand, we must allow for the awareness that if all things come from a source and light is the first creation, then there may be a fundamental unity at the heart of the science and spiritual perspectives here. Spiritual light is really just light from a spiritual perspective and sometimes described as source energy. This would be light or energy that we may not even be able to measure, but which is a part of the underlying fabric of reality. As it relates to us personally, it also may relate with the light of our own awareness, the light of consciousness. As we mentioned earlier, in many cultures, the sun was representative of this understanding, both the light giver and the life giver. It is the nucleus of our solar system and was seen as the light of God. In fact, in the Hermetica, Hermes explains that the sun is the visible representation of the invisible omnipresent super consciousness that we call God. Now, most spiritual understandings hold that God entirely cannot be truly and fully comprehended by us because of how supremely infinite and perfect this power is. Hermes writes that the imperfect and impermanent cannot easily apprehend the eternally perfected but the power through which God creates is source, unified and potential energy. This is explained by the tree of life with the initial three sefirot, Keter, unified potential oneness, Chokmah, the emanation of raw creative source energy, and then Bina, which takes and structures the potential energy into forms that can be molded into whole universes. Of course, many new age traditions suggest that because God was so perfect, unified and whole, it had to create worlds of separateness and finiteness in order to explore the limits of its creative power. And so all the planes of existence were created. And as this happened, the emanations and experiences of each one became more and more separate in nature until it arrived at this physical dimension, AKA here. All around the world, there's an idea that is widely known called enlightenment. To be enlightened is a process of divine awakening to your true spiritual nature to become more aware of a greater understanding of truth or even completely aware, if that's even possible. Enlightenment is often described like shining a light on old belief systems and self-identifications mounting to higher and higher levels of inner and outer truth. Here's an example. On our planet, we had a movement that took place a few hundred years ago called the industrial revolution. We harnessed the power of machines and became conditioned to a lifestyle where we worked with them nine to five and built a mighty modern empire of cities and technology. But in the process, we became slaves to our own systems. To be fair, in the ages before the industrial revolution, people were often slaves to their farms in order to survive. So, you know, it wasn't that much different, but it was also wildly different. Either way, for all of its faults, the industrial revolution was the creation of something new for us. And it propelled us forward technologically into an entire new era of being. What then happened was that our school systems adopted the same model, ultimately to condition our children from a young age to get them into the nine to five system as well, because that was the reality that they were growing up into. At the time, it was the right thing to do because that's what we did. 
And today we are now realizing that the system naturally has its flaws and needs refinement and transformation. We are collectively seeing that this system is conditioning our children to become cogs in the wheels of civilization rather than illuminated creators who are raised to participate fully in their lives and follow their dreams. One of the biggest issues with the current education system at the moment is that the curriculum is designed around teaching menial tasks and basic memorization of information. And in the next 10 to 20 years, a lot of the kinds of jobs that these skills require will be replaced by AI. So we really should be teaching kids to celebrate their creativity and come up with genius solutions to human problems, since our ingenuity is what will define us well into the future. We may also find tremendous value in simply the use of our imagination. For even Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand while imagination embraces the entire world and all there will ever be to know and understand. So what does this have to do with enlightenment? To become enlightened is to become more aware of what is seeing and understanding reality as it currently is, but also how things can work on a higher level with greater and better systems in place designed for our own empowerment. In this particular example, enlightenment could be seen as the sudden illumination of the nature of what our current education system is creating, but then using that awareness to speak to this truth and help transform it into something greater. When you consciously make the choice to seek your true nature, you begin to turn back towards and connect with source energy. You see, enlightenment begins and takes place within across all of these ancient cultures, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, or even shamanic traditions, source or God is often described to be known and experienced within. When we allow ourselves to become a living embodiment of the light that we are, we become a living embodiment of that light. We become enlightened. Now to become truly and fully enlightened, such as the Buddha, it may not be as easy as the illumination of consciousness that we've been describing so far, but it is believed that all of us may walk this path. And that means you too. And when you do, you become not just aware of your divine nature, but every one of your actions matches the luminous quality of your soul. This is truly what makes one enlightened, that they live the light, not just know about it or think about it intellectually. Light also exhibits the wave particle duality. That is the photons that make it up can behave as both a point like particle and a wave depending on if they're measured and observed. The behavior of particles as well-defined points may have a relationship to the reason why this physical reality looks static and feels finite and physical to us. Keep in mind that following the first law of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, energy can't be destroyed, only transmuted. The energy that was created between the molecules and atoms does not disappear out of existence when something dies. It is simply transmuted into some other form. The atoms that make up you were once part of a dying star and when you eventually die, the energy and atoms inside you could end up in some distant galaxy thousands of light years away, giving energy to a supernova. Spiritually speaking, when our physical body dies, our consciousness is thought to move on as well. Our awareness is transmuted and moves into something new. The physical body can decompose, but the true essence of ourselves can't. So let's bring this back around full circle. Does light decompose? Is that even remotely possible? Light can bend, dance, shine, and shimmer. When you break it apart, it becomes a spectrum of color. Considering all things are vibrating at different rates, perhaps the light energy that creates your being too is just a creation of consciousness within a field of possibilities with you at the very center, sharing space with the rest of the universe. Enlightenment is understanding that you are not your thoughts, but the awareness of the thoughts themselves. It is understanding that you have a right to exist because you do exist. And so does everything and everyone else in existence. It is knowing and seeing truth, which is everything that is without any preconceived ideas or stories being put on top of these circumstances. Enlightenment is shining your truth, sharing your light, expressing yourself and consciously participating in reality in the highest way possible. It is choosing growth over stagnation, even if it causes you discomfort. It is asking questions and questioning the answers and always asking more questions. It's making decisions and then letting go and trusting that decision. Acknowledging when you've made a mistake and hurt someone or broke something and then cleaning up your mess. It's taking responsibility for yourself in all your actions. It's also the understanding that you're not alone and that anything is possible. That the kingdom of earth is all around you and the kingdom of heaven is within. 
and by living in a life of love and creative wonder, we can bring heaven to earth. Now, moving forward from there, the universe is crazy big and we understand that it's expanding. To us here on earth, it definitely seems like it just goes on forever, both in time and in space. Of course, in both science and religion, creation is often discussed from the perspective of having a beginning. The standard scientific model for the birth of the cosmos goes something like this. Nearly 14 billion years ago, a tremendous amount of energy materialized as if out of nowhere. In a brief moment of rapid expansion, that burst of energy inflated the cosmos like a balloon. The expansion straightened out any big curves, leading to a largely geometrically flat plane. Before all the flat earthers jump up and down though, let us explain. What we mean by geometrically flat here is whether two beams of light shooting side by side through space will stay parallel forever, rather than eventually crossing and swinging back around to where they started, as it would be the case in a closed universe. If all the matter and energy in the universe, including dark matter and dark energy, at which the energy of the outward expansion balances the energy of inward gravitational pull, space will extend flatly in all directions. Naturally though, gravity acts as a force that curves the universal plane around heavy objects, so it doesn't always appear as a plane. During and shortly after the Big Bang, matter got squished together so that the cosmos appeared largely, if not perfectly, featureless. Here and there, clumps of particles created galaxies and stars, but to be honest, these are just minuscule specks on an otherwise unblemished cosmic canvas. Now in esoteric philosophy, the whole process is generally called emanationism. This is the idea that consciousness or some all present energy created everything by expanding outwards through the planes of existence, gaining greater degrees of density as it trickled down to the physical. In Kabbalah, it is explained as restrictions upon the infinite light, Ein Sof Or, which allowed for the density of matter to come into being from lighter substances. Let's take a step outside the box for a second though, and put these two sides of the cosmic coin into a Vesica Pisces. As usual, the two opposites that never got along actually have quite a lot in common. Both science and spirituality say that the universe began unified and expanded outwards. Both say that light or charge were an important factor in creation. If at the beginning of the universe, all emerged from one essence and became everything, then both are saying the same thing, that we come from the same source. But wait a second. How can we make sense out of the statement, the universe is infinite, if we are measuring it from a sense of having a beginning or an end? As it may seem, the answer is in the cycles. Cycles are everywhere. The way in which we live our lives is made up of cycles, and we have both natural cycles and technological ones. Natural and biological cycles exist built into the universe and the creation process of life. And technological cycles are cycles that we've created and superimposed over top of other natural cycles as a way of measuring and understanding the world that we live in. Time is a perfect example of this. In order to calculate time, you must have speed and distance, but due to the uncertainty principle, when you get down to the subatomic, we can't know an object's position and speed together, as if we know one, the other will spiral off into uncertainty and infinity. So time can't be an intrinsic property of matter. It's simply a measurement of some other cycles. So you could think of it as a measuring tool, such as an hour worth of this, or I'll meet you at six, in the past, we've said it differently, like let's gather again at the next moon cycle. Another example of technological cycles could include anything from our calendars to minutes and seconds, or even more obscure things like life cycles of video game consoles. Some of them, like our year long calendar count, is our interpretation of a natural cycle, the earth orbiting around the sun. Others like video game consoles are completely based on our modern world, such as current technology, the economy, buyer's demand, and what have you. Biological cycles are natural. They happen in relationship to each other and are much more harmonious than the cycles we've often created. The tree doesn't think, is it time to bear fruit yet? I'm just not sure. I think I'll hold off because I'm afraid no one's gonna eat the fruit, right? In nature, the tree just does it. It knows by its inherent instructions what it's supposed to do for its living by its natural design. Other natural cycles could include solar and lunar cycles, the four seasons and the bears that hibernate. If you recall from our episode about the shift to the age of Aquarius, we could map it like this. There are smaller cycles within the larger cycles. Like our celestial cycle, we find it broken up into the four seasons. And inside of that, we have the cycles of the rest of life on earth, all doing their thing in relationship with each other, which are both influenced by and influence the larger cycle. Sometimes it may not seem like the smaller cycles have influence on the larger ones, but everything is connected. If you ever feel like you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping in a room with a mosquito. 
Another example of using micro cycles to shift your own larger ones is daily meditation. Meditate once and yeah, you'll feel all right, I guess, but it's a new thing and whatever, right? But meditate every day for a few weeks and you'll really start to notice that mental fog clearing up and you'll be more focused and alert than ever before. And speaking to that, we have many cycles within our own bodies, such as breathing, drinking, and digestion. These cycles are a lot harder to map out because we are the ones who decide when we eat, what we eat, and how much we eat, as well as how deeply we're breathing and such. But these cycles create massive effects on us throughout our days. You can see how as these cycles become more dense, they happen less often. You breathe more than you eat. Air is less dense than solid food. And so it stands to reason that a dense cycle has a longer duration. As you breathe in, you ride the wave of the breath up. And as you breathe out, you drop the wave back down. As you go about your day, every hour, minute, and second, you are breathing. And if you create a healthy breathing cycle for yourself, then the other cycles you are experiencing, the larger ones, will become more harmonious naturally. If you change the cycle of your breathing, if you alter it to accommodate technological cycles, such as pollution and obesity, then once again, the result is a cycle that is less harmonious with the natural order of things in your body. Some call this dis-ease, the opposite of a natural cycle, which flows with ease, thus disease. Of course, you can always correct a cycle that is in dis-ease. Sure, it might take some time, but with enough steps in the direction of a natural cycle, you'll eventually get yourself back into the flow. If you start your day in a healthy way in the morning, then the rest of your day will flow a lot more harmoniously. If you wake up with the sun, you ride the wave of the entire day and are more in tune with the day itself. This was a hard one for me to put into practice because for many years as a teenager, I was that night owl who would sleep from three or 4 a.m. and get up at noon as a regular practice, at least during the summer. If you think about it, there are different living things which are adapted for different parts of the day. Owls are nocturnal, so they're adapted to see better in the dark. Whereas people can see in dim or dark light, it does take some time for us to adjust unless we superimpose a technological device over top of it like night vision goggles. Now, there are always positive and negative swings in cycles, or maybe a better way of putting it would be periods of expansion and contraction. It's like a sine wave, just up and down all the time and sometimes simultaneously. Such as with a magnet, you have a positive end and a negative end. One is pulling, one is pushing, plus or minus, masculine and feminine polarities. We've explored this in thorough detail in our episode on the seven hermetic principles. A lot of people think that negative means bad and positive means good, but that's not always the case. In fact, Kabbalistically speaking, sometimes the realm of God called Ein Sof, it's considered negative space because it's pre-creation, which is considered positive because it exists. But as stated in the seven hermetic principles, a better way to look at it is masculine and feminine or simply varying polarities based on the direction of the energy. As always, please don't consider this as it relates to man or woman specifically, because all of us have masculine and feminine energies within us. When we don't allow the cycles to flow in their natural way, we often create things that feel uncomfortable over and over, inviting ourselves into realities that we don't actually want. It's actually a sort of short circuit in the cycle or a loop, the positive looping back on itself or the negative looping back on itself. It's not supposed to be a loop, there needs to be a crossing over of the masculine and feminine energies and a kind of balance maintained, but this takes self-awareness to do so. As long as we float through life unconsciously, then our cycles will continue to play out without effortlessness or harmonious flow. And life is just more challenging. Now, of course, we've also made the connection before with the structure of DNA. This is the instruction set and blueprints for the building blocks that make up our being, otherwise known as proteins. As we increase our awareness of these instructions and understanding, we can transcend our 3D perspective of reality and shift into an awareness of the interconnected causality on all of the planes of existence. It's a little trickier than just thinking about though. Understanding and awareness are not necessarily the same thing. Just as a tree does what it does without needing to understand, without a brain, so to speak, understanding is not required for the instructions to be followed. That simply means that as humans, Sometimes our brains get in the way of the natural flow of the cycles. You know, there's a lot of people who like to talk about life from this new age perspective that everything is just love and light all the time. And if we just think happily, even when things aren't going well, we'll be fine. Now, this idea isn't intrinsically wrong because at the highest levels of existence, yes, love and light in the fabric of reality. 
but it is, however, half of the cycle. We must couple action with our thoughts and feelings if we want to ground in transformative change. And we must be willing to embrace and move through the negative cycles if we are to transcend the limits that they put on us. If you wanna explore more about the dangers of only allowing in positive thoughts, check out our video on toxic positivity. If you recall, without the other half of the cycle, we just end up with a loop. Think about it like a flowing river. If you cut off the flow, like with a dam, it creates a blockage and begins to damage everything by stopping the flow. One side experiences death due to dehydration and the other side becomes drowned, which continues to build up weight until eventually the dam will break unless managed, which is of course what people do. Now here's an analogy. Let's say that your friend Sam is making you a delicious sandwich. You've got bread, tomatoes, avocado, chives, maybe some peppers and a roasted portobello mushroom. That is an excellent sandwich, right? Now, let's say that through some random happenstance, something happens and there's a big dollop of poo right on the top of the sandwich. Do you still want it? Can anyone honestly say that they would still want that sandwich? It's perfect and in divine order, right? You don't know, it could have been in perfect divine order to have this poop on this sandwich. But let's be honest, it's certainly not excellent. And I don't care how delicious the other ingredients are, if there's poop on this sandwich, it's a poop sandwich. It doesn't even matter how fresh the rest of the sandwich is, or even how fresh the poop is. It's not something that we wanna eat. The moral of this story is that if there's poop on your sandwich, if there's something in your life that's perfect in many ways, but not excellent, or there's something just ruining the show, don't just sit there and let it be. Don't pretend that it's fine. Find out what it is, why it is the way that it is, what's the energetic cause, and then take some actions to turn it into something you actually truly want. In that alchemy, we can really create some amazing change on this planet. If everyone could just come from that space, we would see a new earth overnight, because no matter how you slice it, many aspects of life that we've set up for ourselves just don't work in the long run. It isn't sustainable. And I think that I can speak for all of us when I say that it could be something different, something magical and more in harmony with ourselves and nature. Picture it, waste-free, flying cars, spirit centers, cloud cities, interstellar travel, and the infinite possibilities that come along with all of that. It's all in the cycles. So with that, let's try to answer the big question from the beginning. How does the infinite universe have a beginning? I have a feeling you might already know. What if it's a cycle? And no, I don't know exactly what it looks like specifically, but I can share with you some ideas about it. Every cycle comes to an end and then begins a new cycle, or maybe it's just the old one continuing on again. In fact, this isn't just some new age speculation anymore. Back in August of 2020, some scientists actually put forward a new bounce simulation theory for the Big Bang that pretty much says exactly this. See, the standard model of the Big Bang emerging from nothing is great. And sure, it matches most of our observations to date, but it leaves a few things up in the primordial soup. For one, in most regions of space-time, the rapid expansion would never stop. As a consequence, inflation can't help but produce a multiverse, which we can't concretely prove yet. Instead, some scientists are proposing that we imagine a universe that expands for maybe a trillion years, driven by the energy of an omnipresent and hypothetical field whose behavior we currently attribute to dark energy. When this energy field eventually grows sparse and distant enough, the universe starts to gently deflate. Over billions of years, everything gets a bit closer, but not all the way down to a point yet. The dramatic change that we all think about when it comes to creation and destruction comes from something called the Hubble radius, which rushes in and eventually becomes microscopic. The Hubble radius is basically the horizon that defines the boundary between particles, that are moving slower and faster than the speed of light relative to an observer. Once that big distance rushes in, the universe's contraction recharges the energy field, which heats up the cosmos and vaporizes its atoms. A bounce ensues and the cycle of a new universe starts anew. And today, while we can't see the remnants of the previous universe, at least not yet, we can see the beginning of the cycle that we are a part of. It's really interesting. If the universe is infinite, how is it that we're existing in a finite space? And is the goal of life to take what is finite and merge it with the infinite to create a new way of life and a new understanding of ourselves? Maybe, at least, that's what the Hermetica seems to describe. The union of our mortal bodies with our immortal souls. And we'll come back around to this at a later time. For now, did you know that there was a time when we believed that the cell was the smallest thing? It was the building block of life, the newspapers read. 
As we began to move through new paradigms of understanding though, new discoveries led to the realization that the cell wasn't in fact the smallest thing. Instead, the molecule was. Now the molecule was the building block of life, the basic element components that make everything up. But then new discoveries revealed that molecules were made of atoms. And now the atom was the smallest thing that you can get. Then, you guessed it, we discovered even smaller subatomic particles like the electron and the proton. So now we have subatomic particles and they are the most fundamental building blocks of all of reality, right? Well, actually no. Subatomic particles are made of combinations of even smaller things called quarks. Okay, hold on. Now string and M theory are the next big thing, which is like vibrating noodles in hyperspace, smaller than all of that other stuff. Then when you get down to the absolute smallest thing in the universe, you get on the level of Planck's constant and stuff is so small that we don't even have the technology or theory to even conceptualize of anything smaller. If there's anything we know for sure, it ought to be that there's always going to be something more or less as the case may be. With all of our mathematics, brilliant scientists and ever evolving understanding, we can look and look forever, but I don't know if we'll actually ever find a bottom anytime soon. So why are we even looking? What is science for? Is it just to know? Why does it even matter? Why should it matter to you? What difference does it make whether atoms or cells or vibrating noodles are the smallest thing? Perhaps it's because our level of understanding directly relates to the level of reality that we have control over, which I suppose could be a very good thing or a very bad thing. Hmm, well, we'll talk about the philosophy a little later because right now we're talking about light. So why light? Well, as we've explored before, it's such an intrinsic substance to the whole universe and many paradigms of belief throughout history have pegged light as a foundational source of all of creation itself. And so what if we could know the shape of light, its most basic characteristics, its smallest building blocks? What if we could understand the fundamental geometry that light moved by? What if it was a three-dimensional geometric form that we could map like a tetrahedron or a cube or something else? How would that change our understanding of reality? You know, I think that's what scientists and maybe all of us at some level are searching for. If light is a building block of creation and we understood it fully, could we become masters of reality? Would it change or evolve our understanding of everything? Speaking to this, Einstein said something amazing, something which has echoed through the halls of science since his death. He said that science should be simple, something that anyone can understand. Anyone can make things complicated and complex, but it takes a genius to make something simple. Equally, Carl Sagan once raised a great point about the education sector. If you were to go to a kindergarten class and see what kind of questions they asked, you'd get some very simple but thought-provoking questions. Why is the earth round? Why is the sky blue? Why do we believe that light is what it is? What even is light? What is a particle? But if you come back to a class of 11th and 12th graders, they don't ask these kinds of questions anymore. The creativity and sense of wonder about the universe has often been sapped out of them. It's fair to say something between first and 11th grade went wrong somewhere, and that's the biggest tragedy. Why is it that for the average Joe, these ideas about existence and reality are so hard to understand without resorting to technical jargon? Is there a way that we can use geometry to explain and simplify these ideas in a way that works and makes sense that we can see? And most importantly, how can you use this information in a way to grow as a person? But let's not just build up beliefs about these topics. Let's expand our ability to create with them. It's often theorized from creation myths, the flower of life geometry, and even in the big bang theory that light is among the first things created at the beginning of everything. So exploring and discovering how light works would be a fundamental piece of understanding everything. Particle physics is a branch of physics that studies the nature of the particles that constitute matter and radiation. It looks at the most fundamental and elementary particles that make up existence and how they behave. Particles in this sense are thought of as excitations in their corresponding quantum fields. In particle physics, scientists are trying to find the one thing that creates everything else or at least the phenomenon that they are observing. It is closely related to quantum mechanics, which uses similar ideas to study the world at the subatomic level. Scientists in these fields have done a lot of work in theorizing and exploring a unified field theory, which argues that everything in the universe is connected through an infinite web of something. They're not sure what it is, but we can see how we're connected in a grand and mysterious way. 
A fun example of this is touch. In our lives, we all have a fairly intuitive understanding of what it's like to touch something, right? You put your hand on a rock and it's pretty solid and usually cold and rigid. But here's the thing, you've never actually touched anything in your life. Let me explain. You would know from high school physics that charges repel, right? So electrons have negative charge and surround the nucleus of an atom in a kind of probability cloud. The thing is, negative charge repels negative charge. So when you're sitting on your couch, the electrons in your butt are actually repelling the electrons in the couch. So technically, you are levitating via electromagnetic repulsion at an infinitely small distance. But you can feel the couch behind you, right? So what's going on? Well, long story short, your body and brain communicate through electrical impulses and signals. So it's simply converting that electromagnetic repulsion into a sensation that you feel physically. This brings up a big problem though. As you might've guessed, since atoms don't have boundaries in the same sense that we physically do here, our understanding of touch makes no sense in the atomic world. So there are three possible meanings of touch at the atomic level. One, two objects influence each other. Two, two objects influence each other significantly. Or three, two objects reside in the exact same location. The problem is the mainstream image of an atom isn't really very accurate. The electron doesn't spin around in a single location with a well-defined orbit like we see in textbooks. Actually, atoms are not really solid spheres at all. They are fuzzy probability clouds filled with electrons spread out into waving cloud-like shapes called orbitals. They're kind of like actual clouds. They can have a location and shape, but no physical boundary. So in theory, they could overlap with each other. This is possible because atoms have regions of high density and regions of low density. When a physicist says, we have an atom at point X, what they mean is that the high density portion of the atom's probability cloud is located at point X, not the whole thing. Since electrons behave like waves on a subatomic level, if you were to put an electron in a box, only part of it is there. Part of its wave leaks through the walls of the box and out into infinity, something that makes quantum tunneling possible. In other words then, if touching is taken to mean that two atoms influence each other, then atoms are always touching two atoms that are held a mile apart could still have their wave functions overlapping. In theory, two atoms influence each other no matter where they are in the universe because they extend out in all directions. In practice though, if two atoms are more than a few nanometers apart, their influence on each other typically becomes so small that it's overshadowed by the influence of closer atoms, so it can be ignored. But in theory, everything is connected to everything else in one big quantum field of some kind with things at the smallest level phasing in and out of existence within it. As our sciences have looked smaller and smaller to find the smallest particle, we have reached a point where things get so small that we can no longer define what they look like. We try and define what particles are through abstract concepts in mathematics because we say that particles are unseeable and unknowable, and yet things are always going to get smaller and smaller. Everything is made of something else and it fractals down to infinity or it spirals off larger to infinity either way. Some scientists have actually been known to cut infinite numbers when they find them because they're deliberately looking for finiteness instead of embracing the infinite nature and puzzle of reality. It's something that scientists all over the world are trying to figure out. See, the speed of light is about 299,792,458 meters per second. What we know in the field of science is that there's something that translates these particles from one side of the equation to the other, from the world of no mass into the world of mass. If you ask a scientist this question, they would tell you that it's the Higgs field, the ever permeating field that gives things mass. In essence, light speed particles pass through the Higgs field and slow down and gain a property of mass. The popular Higgs boson is the particle that is created upon the light speed particle merging with the Higgs field. According to our formulas, this boson along with the particle is supposed to come out having gained some mass and slowed down. But I think there's an important piece of information that we're missing here though and it starts with asking some questions. First of all, what even is mass? Mass is said to represent an amount of matter, but even matter has no universally agreed upon definition. The conventional one is that matter is any substance that has mass and takes up space by having volume, which kind of seems counterintuitive. The thing is, mass has a good abstract or mathematical definition as the property or charge that gives rise to the gravitational field, which, as it turns out, is pretty much exactly the same thing as the property of inertia, which is what Newton was on about with his whole F equals MA thing. While we can think about mass like this, 
there's not really a good way to visualize what it actually is. And part of the reason for that lies in how physics studies and defines things. At the moment, physics is very good at answering the how questions, usually by making some informed assumptions based on observation and evidence. But we have no way of seeing how those assumptions emerge or why they are the way they are. At the moment, we have to just take the fundamental forces as fundamental until we gain a new paradigm of understanding that allows us to look at where things emerge from and eventually return to. In that case, maybe we can link mass with inertia and think of it as being a manifestation of a disturbance of some kind in the universal ether grid thingy that gives rise to everything. Talking about whether light has mass can be even harder though. Light is made up of photons. So we could ask if a photon has mass and the answer to that is usually no the photon is a massless particle. According to physics, it has energy and momentum, but no mass. But even then, there are still debates about which kinds of mass we're talking about. In other words, because photons have energy, and as Einstein taught us, energy is equal to the mass of a body multiplied by the speed of light squared, E equals MC squared, how can photons have energy if they have no mass? Actually, what Einstein was saying here is that energy and mass could be the same thing. In other words, all energy has some form of mass. Light may not have rest mass, known as invariant mass, i.e. the weight that describes the heft of an object, but because of Einstein's theory and the fact that light behaves like it has mass in that it's subject to gravity, we can say that mass and energy exist together. In that case, we would call it relativistic mass, mass when an object is in motion as opposed to at rest. So technically, we could say that a box of light weighs more than a box without light. Sure, as long as we're measuring the amount of energy as the weight, not something on a scale like kilograms or pounds. Because of all of our fancy equations as described earlier, we have kind of thrown all ideas about what light could actually look like out the window in favor of complex equations that describe it instead. But I wanna offer a different perspective. As mentioned before, what if we could know the shape of light? What if we could actually define what the structure of light was? What if there was a basic geometry of the universe that we were missing? Even more interestingly, what if light was a geometric form and there was no difference between the geometry of light and the simplest particle? What if the difference between mass and no mass was not about the speed that it traveled, but also the density of the information held within this fundamental shape, this form? Maybe the speed of the particle is interdependent upon the information that was carried within it. And the more information it holds, the denser it becomes. I have a few conceptual examples to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. The first is water vapor and stay with me. See, water has a heavy density, but when it heats up, it translates into vapor and rises into the air. It essentially takes a 90 degree turn, which we talked about going back to the ancient Egyptian philosophy where it moves up into the sky and merges itself together to become clouds. As the clouds become packed, denser and denser with so much information packed within it, eventually it has no choice but to release and all of the water comes pouring down. Conceptually, you could think of it like changing from a high speed particle into a denser one based on the density of the information within the droplet, as well as the speed that it was traveling. Now, I recognize that this only partially works as an example because we're not describing light speed particles, though following as above, so below, perhaps there's a common theme here. If we can take this idea and apply it to light, imagine if it worked in a similar way. Let's think about photosynthesis a burst of energy from the sun travels towards the earth as both a wave and a particle in the form of a photon. It has properties of both and it's moving at the speed of light and passes through a plant. That plant then absorbs the information and energy that it needed from the wave particle that passed through it. The plant then uses that information, the photons that it took from the sunlight and uses it to create something with mass, merging its energy with water and other plant matter to create sugars and other nutrients. It kind of reminds me of the Higgs boson, transmuting massless particles into massed ones. So just an idea here, but if light is geometric, it can be both a wave and particle simultaneously. If light is a solid, it can have both density or nothing inside it at all. If light is a solid, what could it look like? What my friends and I have come up with is a combination of three forms, the three simplest shapes in existence. And as you look at it, ask yourself, can we simplify it further? As we covered, light is composed of two primary forces, electricity and magnetism, thus electromagnetic radiation. 
you remember everything that we've talked about with masculine and feminine energy? Electricity being masculine and magnetism being feminine, curves and points, both of which are found on this shape. Looking at the flower of life, which is considered the blueprint for life and reality itself, you can see that's exactly how it works. You have masculine energy, the particles, the dots, the places where the lines intersect, and feminine energy, the waves, the curves. Now you might notice inside the flower of life, there are two ways we can look at it. We can see circles, lots and lots of circles that make up this whole image. And this is the feminine perspective. But you can also choose to see this, this little shape that looks like a seed, which makes up the entire picture from these seeds aligning themselves perfectly with each other in beautiful six-fold symmetry. This is the masculine perspective. This seed today has been coined the Trion Ray, named by the man who discovered it, Michael Evans. He is a man who has given a large part of his life to exploring and working with sacred geometry, and his discoveries are amazing. The flower of life in two dimensions is a flat 2D representation of the way the universe fits together in higher frequencies and higher planes. So Michael saw this and asked the big question, if this is the universe from a 2D perspective, what would it look like in three? So he began modeling and molding three-dimensional flower of lives together and discovered some pretty remarkable things. Following the principles from the cycles and sine waves that we discussed before, one idea that Michael puts forth is that everything breathes and everything lives, just as the Hermetica describes that everything in the cosmos is a part of a great living mind. And so at the level of basic geometry and intrinsic fundamental forms, perhaps too, we have breath. He learned that every geometry we think we know of is a static and fixed perspective of what it could really be. Instead of a tetrahedron, how about a tetrine and a tetrex, an inhale and exhale of this basic form. For an icosahedron, here's an icosatrine and an icosatrex. He developed breathing models for all of the platonic solids, and then he found a new solid, one that hadn't been discovered before. We understand thanks to the wave particle duality that energy and light, even if it moves in straight lines, can also move in curves. By incorporating curves into the basic geometry of our platonic solids, you actually discover much simpler particles that before we never knew existed. And so it comes back to these three images. The first one, as you know, is the sphere. This is one of the simplest forms and the most feminine. It's all curve, baby. It's not hard to see how this form is used in the creation of all things. Just look at a planet or a star or even an egg. Next, we have the Trinity and the Trion Ray. I'd actually like to make a distinction here. The Trinity is three spheres put together like a Vesca Pisces and the Trion Ray is 1 16th of the volume of that. In three dimensions, they both come out with three edges, three faces and two points, smaller than any other shape. It's a single shape that contains both particles and waves, which are both equally important. This Trion Ray is the geometry of a straight line. For if you were to draw any of the platonic solids, you could replace all of the straight lines with the Trion Ray and you would get a diagram of both the inhale and the exhale of that platonic solid. The great artist Delacroix once said, it would be worthy to investigate whether straight lines exist only in our brains. The interesting thing about the Trion Ray and the Vesca Pisces is that they both have straight lines as well as curves and it's just a matter of perspective. One of the most important pieces of information about all of these shapes though, is that this is how form comes into manifestation from a geometric perspective, from source to the material world. The sphere is a ball, it's all curved. Upon adding a second sphere, you get the first edge. And so this has curves and edges. But when you add the third sphere, you get the first points. And now you have curves, edges, and points all together in one shape. As you continue adding circles, you get more and more shapes and forms that begin to manifest such as the platonic solids and everything that we know about. This is why the Vesca Pisces is so important. As you know, we've been looking at this for a long time and we're going to continue to. Over the past year, I've been learning that the Vesca Pisces is one of the most important keys for waking up and transforming on this planet. It's a model for bringing people together and creating powerful change. As we grow together and make more connections with each other, it's these connections that begin to alter the way that we do things. We help each other refine our messages. We come to understand each other, to learn from each other, to grow together. It is asking each other questions that allows us to explore deeper into what something really means. And then with our newfound information that we gather together, we can set off on a journey to change the world. And so 
Ladies and gentlemen, what I propose today is that these three forms may very well be the most fundamental geometry of reality, the true God particles. We have a masculine form, a feminine form, and a form of emerging together of them both. Our idea of the God particles here is not a matter of scale. They're not necessarily the smallest thing in existence, but rather the simplest geometry that we can conceive of in this dimension. It is a geometry that makes up all manner of things, regardless of size and scale. Just look around you. Most seeds look like this. Most leaves like this. Most fruit looks like this. Eggs look like this. Sperm looks like this. It's practically impossible not to find examples of it everywhere. All we need to do is look. Now from here, let us bridge some gaps between the previous topics about light. In the beginning, we talked about spiritual light from a perspective of infinite energy that is everywhere and encompasses all things, from which all things come from and which all things return to. Now let's explore what source energy actually means. How can we make sense of it with our modern understanding in the third dimension? And more importantly, what does it mean for you? We know in science that everything is energy. All of the food, the light bouncing around, the animals, the people, the trees and the plants, even our furniture, it's all energy. Some of it is alive, which means an essence of life flows through it and compels it to grow, act, and sometimes do crazy ass things. I know that essence of life is a little vague. It's hard to describe even for me. While today there are many researchers delving into that ultimate question of what is a soul, there are still no concrete answers to this question, despite thousands of years of philosophical debate. Although if you haven't seen our videos about the nature of the soul, I highly recommend checking that out. Despite this, let's see what we can dig up here when we explore this question both scientifically and spiritually. When I say life essence, what I'm describing is the difference between a person and say a couch. One is alive, it has life, it has a soul, the body has spirit flowing through it. It has consciousness, awareness. That spirit or life is what can create a couch, but a couch cannot create life. Now, a person likewise is also a creation. A person is a body of energy that was created by a man and a woman who came together in union to birth a new life into this world. So what this means is that we're all creations and we're all creators. We can create both living and non-living things. So what does this have to do with source energy? When we're talking about this grand and mysterious source, let's just try and keep things tethered to the third dimension, our physical world. It's easy to go out there into the mystical magical universe, but that doesn't really help us right here and now. So first of all, let's define what these words even mean. The modern definition of source is a place, a person or thing from which something comes from or can be obtained. Even older before that, the etymology of source is support or base, which comes from the old French word, which meant beginning described as a fountainhead of a river or stream. So when we ask the question of what is source energy, we get to take a look and see all of the fractaling layers of where something comes from, in this case, us. As Carl Sagan said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. At the largest scale of our source, we indeed have the whole universe. The source field of energy that brought about the manifestation of our solar system came from what we often describe as the Big Bang. And then of course, all of the interactions within this vast sea of galaxies inside the universe. Yeah, we're in there somewhere. On a level beneath that, we have our sun, a source of life for all of us, which shines its light, keeps us warm, and gives us the energy that the earth absolutely needs in order to sustain life. On a level beneath that, we have the earth. She's required in tandem with the sun in order for us to live. As we continue to fractal it down, we start to get to levels that most people don't often consider to be source energy, if only because we don't really think of it. The source of the food we eat comes from plants, and it may also come from some animals. We'll leave the conversation of health and meat and animal foods and all that stuff out of this video, because the fact of the matter is humans eat a lot of it, whether it's good for us or not. But that said, we do have a full movie about healing with food, just in case you wanna check that out. The source of the water we drink often comes from lakes, rivers, streams, and underground water. A large source of our electricity right now comes from our manipulation of oil, gas, the splitting of atoms, and the movement of water. And that's something I think a lot of us would desire to change into something new that works with nature instead of against it. And perhaps the most important source of all is each other. See, without your parents, you would not have been born. Without your close friends and loved ones, your world would be an empty and cold place. Especially today, there are many people who are struggling in a lonely and isolated environment. 
and it's one of the biggest challenges we're facing today, even before the pandemic. And now recognize in this moment that when you flip it all around, you can see that you too are a source of energy for everyone in your life. But what kind of energy? Creative, supportive, controlling, aloof? I invite you to look at your relationships, your friends, your family, and see what kind of source you are. Are you the one who gives by means of cooking, helping others with their problems? Perhaps you play music, make videos, write blogs. Maybe you invent things. The moment that someone comes into contact with your energy, whether it's in person or online or through something that you made, you become a source of energy and awareness for them to receive. And we are all connected. You are as influential on me as I am of you. I'm no different from you. I'm human. Well, I'm human. Patchman's a cartoon. And so with that, we can see that we are all of source and we are all a source ourselves. At the grandest level, we are a part of this whole majestic universe. And at a very relatable level, we are all physically the source for each other's growth, transformation, and even entertainment. However, as it relates to source, this is a much bigger conversation than just the sources that we can see and know in our day-to-day -day lives, but also the source of everything, God. We talked about God at the beginning of this movie so long ago. God is, for all intents and purposes, the ultimate source behind all things, at least as far as the beliefs about God goes. We can learn a lot about God by studying the various world religions and spiritualities, whether it be the Abrahamic faiths, Eastern traditions, shamanic, or anything else. The Hermetic philosophies specifically carry many great ideas that unify the ideas about God found in other traditions and explain that God works through a vast and infinite mind outside of the reaches that we can see and perceive, yet can be known through experience, contemplation of the divine, and through thought. As an example, Hermes writes in one particular text using the Egyptian name Atum for God, which simply means hidden one. And in this passage, he explains the following. Atum is whole and constant. In himself, he is motionless, yet he is self-moving. He is immaculate, incorruptible, and everlasting. He is the supreme absolute reality. He is filled with ideas which are imperceptible to the senses and with all embracing knowledge. Atum is primal mind. He is too great to be called by the name Atum, God, or the One. He is hidden yet obvious everywhere. His being is known through thought alone, yet we see his form before our eyes. He is bodiless yet embodied in everything. There is nothing which he is not. He has no name because all names are his name. He is the unity in all things. So we know him by all names and call everything Atum. He is the root and source of all. Everything has a source except this source itself, which springs from void. Atum is complete like the number one, which remains itself whether multiplied or divided and yet generates all numbers. Atum is the whole which contains everything. He is one, not two. He is all, not many. The all is not many separate things, but the oneness that subsumes the parts. The all and the one are the same. You think that things are many when you view them as separate, but when you see they all hang on the one and flow from the one, you will realize they are united, linked together and connected by a chain of being from the highest to the lowest, all subject to the will of the one. The cosmos is one as the sun is one, the moon is one and the earth is one. Do you think there are many gods? That's absurd, God is one. Atum alone is the creator of all that is immortal and all that is mutable. If that seems incredible, just consider yourself. You see, speak, hear, touch, taste, walk, think, and breathe. It is not a different you who does these various things, but one being who does them all. To understand how a tomb makes all things, consider a farmer sowing seeds, here wheat, there barley, now planting a vine, then an apple tree. Just as the same man plants all these seeds, so a tomb sows immortality in heaven and change on earth. Throughout the cosmos, he disseminates life and movement, the two great elements that comprise Atum and his creation, and so everything that is. Atum is called father because he begets all things, and from his example, the wise hold begetting children, the most sacred pursuit of human life. Atum works with nature, within the laws of necessity, causing extinction and renewal constantly creating creation to display his wisdom. Yet the things that the eye can see are mere phantoms and illusions. 
Only those things invisible to the eye are real. Above all are the ideas of beauty and goodness. Just as the eye cannot see the being of Atum, so it cannot see these great ideas. They are attributes of the one alone and they are inseparable from him. They are so perfectly without blemish that Atum himself is in love with them. There is nothing which Atum lacks, so nothing he desires. There is nothing that Atum can lose, so nothing can cause him grief. Atum is everything, Atum makes everything, and everything is a part of Atum. Atum therefore makes himself, this is his glory. He is all creative and this creating is his very being. It is impossible for him to ever stop creating for Atum can never cease to be. Atum is everywhere. Mind cannot be enclosed because everything exists within mind. Hopefully this provides some semblance of an understanding about the nature of source itself and how we might view it. Looking to the hermetic laws of the universe, one of which is the law of cause and effect, there is always a cause and effect of everything. And thus we must recognize that all in all, everything is interrelated and interconnected in this grand infinite field that we call reality, a cosmic sandbox for us to play in and experience life together and learn to become the creators that we intrinsically are. As we move this conversation forward, it's now time to talk a little bit deeper about matter and energy. Matter in particular is very interesting to me because it's something that so far in all of our scientific fields, we still haven't pinned down yet. As we talked about earlier, the conventional definition for matter is any substance that has mass and takes up space by having volume. So in other words, we can think of it as anything that includes atoms and anything made up of them, as well as any particles that act as if they have both rest mass and volume. But since we're talking about things that have mass, photons and therefore light itself, it isn't usually considered matter because it doesn't have rest mass. There's also different phases or states of matter that vary in vibration and density. However, following the Kabbalion, even the most dense forms still vibrate as nothing in the universe rests. When something is created on a geometric level, it forms a vessel, a container to store the internal ingredients that are being actively created inside. The best way I can describe this is by examining the behavior of our own bodies. For us, our skin acts as a boundary layer between the internal and the external world and was created from the genetic ingredients from the yin and the yang. When transformation takes place, when two energies become one, something new is created. Well, obviously that's the case, but let's really think about this. It's not just a mixture of two things in the sense that the energies just come together and that's it. It's something new entirely on a spiritual level. It's almost like a new toroidal field, a new soul, and maybe even a new awareness. When something is brought into being, its first initial state is in that space of both voidness and awareness, something between all states of matter and all states of energy all at once. Now, what are these two worlds? I don't think I have to describe the world of matter to you. It's the physical world, the material world. Now the world of energy, on the other hand, really, you could call it all kinds of things, the unified field, the astral realm, the source field, the energetic properties of matter, and even the place where your own imagination can thrive. These planes are intimately connected with each other. And through the awareness of both, we find meaning usually in the relationships between one and the other. The big question though, is whether there's a point where one world of form begins and the other ends. When does spirit, energy, essence, or whatever you wanna call it, make that transition into matter? And how can we think about that? In other words, is there a singularity point in creation where things go into that undefined zone and break down into one form or another? And first, let's define exactly what we mean by singularity. Originally, a singularity was defined generally as a unique event with large consequences. It was then adopted by mathematics to describe the point in an equation where a function becomes undefined and spirals off. If you were to plot an undefined function on a graph, as X becomes smaller, Y spirals to infinity. But that doesn't mean that when X equals zero, Y equals infinity, since X can also be negative. This is one of the big mysteries of mathematics. We don't know why, but when you divide by zero, math breaks down and becomes undefined, meaning one aspect of an equation spirals off into infinity or negative infinity. And at that point breaks down and goes back into that undefined zone, which is the singularity. In physics talk, 
Singularities are used in the context of black holes when talking about the event horizon, that point around the hole where the pull of gravity becomes so huge that nothing can escape it, not even light. As with the undefined function though, once you cross that singularity event horizon, physics goes nuts and starts to behave in entirely new and weird ways because gravity and density becomes infinitely large and the rules transition from one form into another. Singularities are kind of like those boundary points between one form and another, where once you cross them, you make a transition into an entirely new mode of being. In the Thrive movie, they talked about this, which puts it all into a spiritual perspective. They described the toroidal fields and the way that they couple together with each other. When the field spins one way, it has a different effect than when it spins in the opposite direction. Then when they come together, they create a new field in the center, which is both of the previous two and neither all at the same time. This is the same geometry as the child's conception. Two forces or energies come together to create something new entirely. Toroidal fields must be able to come together at any angle, which you can see just by looking at the flower of life. For example, in coming together side by side to create the Vesca Pisces, they also create a new shape in the middle, a blending of matter and energy between the two. If this is the creation of a new form, what that would mean is a new state, so to speak. For matter to translate into energy and for energy to translate into matter. If energy cannot be created nor destroyed, then it must be able to transition back and forth between different states of matter with different densities and even into different states of energy. Now, when we think about the relationship of matter and energy, light appears to be something fundamental to reality. The spectrum that light is on is much more vast than just the visible spectrum. When light gets to the top of the visible spectrum, a natural transition takes place. Now, perhaps it's seamless for the light, but for us, it disappears from view. It's possible though, that much like the musical frequencies shifting up an octave, light too takes a 90 degree turn and shifts directions in some way. An example of this could be what happens when the light from the flame gets to the top of that flame wave. It moves out of visible perception and becomes something else. This idea could also apply to your eyeballs. At what point does light going into your eye translate into the physical receptors in your brain? For that matter, where's the transition between those electrical charges in your brain and your vast array of thoughts inside your mental world? In order to answer that question, we have to take a look at ourselves. We are at the center of both of these worlds and planes. With our physical bodies, we can interact with the physical world and through our thoughts and emotions, we can interact with a particular dimension of a more energetic world, which lately we've been calling the dream time. Engagement with the internal and the external happens simultaneously as a unified experience. When you see something external, you feel or think about it internally. They mirror each other. Likewise, when you feel something, that feeling happens on both an energetic level and in your physical body. Physically, a hormone is released and energetically, waves of emotion radiate out and affect those around you. A hormone is the physical representation of the energetic feeling and the feeling is the energetic representation of that hormone. Both of them happen simultaneously in relationship to something that's affecting you. It's like the four elements constantly playing out the physical and the energy of what's internal and what's physical and the energy and physicality of that which is outside of you. So at the moment of conception, both the internal and the external energies of each seed and egg come together to create a new form completely. One that has dominion over the ingredients that were provided and one that is under the care of those who conceived it in the first place. Amazingly, the first forms created at conception, usually around week five, are divided into three layers. The top layer will give rise to your baby's outermost layer of skin, central and peripheral nervous systems, eyes, and inner ears. Equally, the baby's heart and a primary circulatory system will form in the middle layers of cells, which also sets the scene for the foundation of bones, ligaments, kidneys, and a lot of the reproductive system. The inner layer of cells is where the baby's lungs and intestines will develop. So it's interesting that skin, or at the very least, the epidermis, a boundary layer between the inside and the outside is one of the first things to form during conception. Geometrically, this is a physical expression of the squaring of the circle and the circling of the square, which we looked at in our video about evolution. As the embryo grows, it goes into and out of phi. You might remember how we looked at this with the stages of an embryo's growth in our episode about the power of the heart. As cell division occurs, the first stage is a sphere, and then it creates eight spheres, 
the basis of the Merkaba and also forming the egg of life and a cube. It then forms a toroidal field blob with an organ in the center. This is life's attempt at creating the phi ratio between the matter and the energy of the body of consciousness that is developing inside that womb. But it's a process that doesn't stop. You don't stop growing emotionally, mentally, physically, or spiritually until you die. And even when you die, well, what is death but a transition into something new? What that means is that you and I are not the inside nor the outside of our physical vessels, but the awareness between both of them and the creator of so much more. What this whole thing is essentially explaining though, is that we are akin to vessels of energy, vessels of information that bring through a mixture of both light and physical elements as well. The more we work with ourselves, the more we participate with our own evolution. And thus, the more we harmonize with these elements within us. Our emotions, our bodies, our will, our thoughts, and the light of our souls. Much like the universe itself is a vessel for light that contains the light of trillions of stars, so too are we vessels of our own light. And in a way, the atoms and energy inside of us are connected to the universe as our atoms and energy will eventually return to the universe and make up some other great event like a supernova or the birth of a star in thousands of years. By comprehending this simple yet profound truth that you are made of the same light of a thousand stars and yet contain within you the same minerals and elements of the earth and the dust of a distant planet, maybe now you might just understand just how connected you are to everything and how infinite everything really is. Our universe is beautiful and light is its beating heart. This episode was inspired by an early Joe Rogan podcast where he featured Dr. Stephen Greer, the founder of CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, as well as the Disclosure Project. He's a man who has brought to light over 4,000 cases of UFO landings and over 3,500 pilot cases of UFO sightings and over 500 reports of whistleblowers from military and government officials reporting on both UFOs as well as ET encounters, including over a hundred of these reports on videotape. And on a completely side note, Joe, if you're watching, please bring Dr. Greer back on your show. Anyways, what he described in this podcast is that all of these ETs who are visiting the planet, and they're definitely real by the way, are not coming here in methods that are within the confines of the speed of light or slower, because it would take millennia to actually travel across the universe at these abysmally slow speeds. They're actually moving faster than light somehow. Now he explains that after passing the speed of light, it's an entirely different and new kind of physics, different than anything we currently know. While the prevalence of light being the fastest thing has been experimentally proven by our current model of physics, if there are aspects of the universe that are unseen by us and based in undiscovered laws, then perhaps the belief of light above all is limiting us from perceiving an even greater truth. The constant interpretation of people looking at this information, saying it's debunked and then ridiculing it is actually holding us back socially and technologically. In one particular moving section of this interview, Stephen explains that at one time he sat down with the CIA director's family and the director's wife asked him, well, how are they getting here? Referring to the aliens. And he answered that they have this advanced technology that interfaces between thought and consciousness. He describes that just like crossing the sound barrier was a big deal, the light barrier is going to be an even bigger deal. And when we do, we're going to cross into these sort of multi-phasic resonant dimensions, part of which hook into the singularity of mind and thought. The CIA director's wife looked at him with wide eyes and just went, wow, I knew it had to be something like that. And it was right then in that moment that I decided we had to make this video. Part of the challenge of understanding the faster than light conundrum is getting to know the initial problem in the first place. And why do scientists believe that there's nothing faster? To quote Neil deGrasse Tyson in his book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, we find the following. Among all constants, the speed of light is the most famous. No matter how fast you go, you will never overtake a beam of light. Why not? No experiment ever conducted has ever revealed an object of any form reaching the speed of light. Well-tested laws of physics predict and account for that fact. I know these statements sound closed-minded, some of the most boneheaded science-based proclamations in the past have underestimated the ingenuity of inventors and engineers. We will never fly. Flying will never be commercially feasible. We will never split the atom. We will never break the sound barrier. We will never go to the moon. What they have in common is that no established law of physics stood in their way. 
The claim, we will never outrun a beam of light, is a qualitatively different prediction. It flows from basic, time-tested physical principles. Highway signs for interstellar travelers of the future will justifiably read, the speed of light, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. To actually get into the science of light and the whole deal here is honestly a whole video on its own. But basically, the speed of light is this curious property of light where it travels at a particular speed, no matter what. Even if you were flying a spaceship at half the speed of light and had headlights in front of the ship, that light would still travel at the speed of light, no faster, measured from any perspective moving or not. As Neil wrote, no modern physics experiment has ever found any evidence of anything moving faster. But then again, as Stephen Greer described, on the other side of that barrier may be an entirely different kind of physics. Perhaps we don't even have the tools to measure the mysteries beyond that barrier. With a new kind of physics, perhaps we get into a more quantum understanding of the universe again, being able to move forwards and backwards through time and leap massive distances through space that would be impossible on this side of the light speed barrier. So, okay, maybe there is some way that is beyond our understanding on how to move through this faster than light dimension, which of course opens the doors of curiosity for all of us. But then the question becomes, what else is out there? A very big question in science right now is concerned with the mysterious cosmic substances, dark matter and dark energy. Could these mysterious things, virtually undetectable to us, besides that they produce gravity, be waiting for us on the other side of the light barrier? Now, what's especially curious about this is that we find a link to the mysteries of dark matter and energy in a place that you might not expect, the work of Dr. Rick Strassman, PhD. This is a man who has pioneered psychedelic research for all of us in a profound way with his work with DMT, which he coined the spirit molecule, leading to the publishing of his book and movie of the same name. In his writings, he challenges all conventional thinking about science, consciousness, and dimensions with some absolutely profound and groundbreaking research, which any scientist today should take special note of because of the implications of his incredible studies. Over the course of several years, Rick led the expedition to administer several hundred doses of DMT to participants in a study to see if there were any clinical benefits of using DMT. What the study revealed, however, opened up a wormhole of possibilities that could potentially change our understanding of ourselves and the universe forever. Over and over, Rick's participants all experienced these incredible psychedelic voyages that often included seeing environments and realms that were outside of what could physically exist in our universe or meeting alien beings in many sizes and shapes who interacted with the participants. Rick tried over and over to rationalize this for the conventional thinking says that psychedelics simply reveals in your mind what is already within you. But enough participants reported meeting these same or similar beings that seemed outlandish to think that these experiences were all just happening inside of people's heads. Not only did the research suggest that the participants' consciousness was actually being taken to another dimension of sorts, meeting beings who are not from the same plane that we exist in, but the participants also said the exact same thing. They claimed definitively that this was not an experience isolated within them, but they knew without a shadow of a doubt that they actually met these other beings for real. To any scientist who outright denies this suggestion, I challenge you to go exploring with plant medicine in a sacred and ceremonial way. I know Rhythmia will take you and see if you feel the same way after. That's not to say that psychedelics are exclusively a cosmic and external experience, but that it seems to open you up for conscious expansion, both internally and externally in both this dimension and others. The reason that I bring all this up is because Dr. Strassman describes this may even relate with the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. Aha, you see, we've come full circle. In DMT, the spirit molecule, he wrote the following. The strangest realms to which DMT might lead are those that exist within the mysterious realms of dark matter. There, which may indeed be here, no one knows what we will find. Dark matter comprises at least 95% of this universe's mass. In other words, nearly all of the matter in the universe is invisible. We cannot see it. It neither generates nor reflects radiation of any type, visible or otherwise. The only way we know it is there is by its gravitational effects. It must exist by virtue of the fact that the visible universe maintains its particular shape. Without this mass, there would not be enough gravity to hold the universe together. It would fly apart. Scientists have nominated several candidates for the stuff that comprises dark matter. Normal matter that radiates little or no light, planets, dead or unborn stars, and black holes may account for about 20% of dark matter. However, it's likely that most, 
if not all dark matter consists of particles quite different from our familiar protons, electrons, and neutrons. These black particles may obey entirely different laws of physics, unlike those in parallel universes. Finding ourselves in a world comprised of them, we most likely would not recognize much. Either of these invisible levels of existence, parallel universes or dark matter, are present at the same time as this reality. Thus, they both are options we must consider for where DMT takes us when our consciousness is no longer in this plane of existence. The immediacy of the transition makes appealing these two alternate viewpoints regarding the incredibly unusual places our volunteers describe. This is because they're as much here as there. So the question about inside versus outside, as many volunteers posed it, really no longer has any meaning. Before performing the DMT research, I never would have suggested that familiarity with alien abduction phenomena would be important in providing the best possible supervision for these sessions. However, I do now. I also believe it's helpful to know everything about current theories regarding invisible realms like dark matter and parallel universes. Equipped with these types of training and experiences, research scientists and staff will be ready to understand, accept, and react to nearly everything that might come up during deep psychedelic sessions. And so, bringing things to a close, we must strive to answer the question from the beginning. What, if anything, can go faster than light? It seems that with certain technology, perhaps even physical objects can, as we've seen with the stories of the ships. But as far as our own bodies and minds go, at least what Dr. Strassman has discovered, it seems very possible that even if our bodies are limited here, perhaps consciousness is the one thing that permeates everywhere, including beyond the speed of light, perhaps at least with some help from a little bit of DMT that is. I feel with all of this information, the biggest thing for me is that when scientists make definitive statements about absolutes in the universe, the proper response seems to be healthy skepticism, that there are so many mysteries in the cosmos that it seems arrogant to suggest that we understand everything perfectly, especially when the standard model, quantum mechanics, and even gravity are incomplete and do not fully connect with each other. Especially with the work of some of these great people we've discussed today, it would seem as though there's something going on to suggest not only that there's another reality waiting for us beyond the light barrier, but that we may even be naturally equipped to explore these realms within us. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>